And welcome back to Coast to Coast. George Nori along with Cheryl Jones and Open Lines this hour. Cheryl, since you've been doing this program, what, how many years now with us? Couple? <laughs> oh, yes. Um, started in September of um, 2019. Are you getting uh, no recognition when you go out or anything like that? People say, hey, I heard you on Coast to Coast. Yes, I recognize my radio face. <laughs> That's right, a face for radio. <laughs> right. Uh, I get a lot of email, and I really appreciate hearing from our listeners. Uh, they have uh, a lot of interesting ideas, and um, it's just great uh, hearing how how uh, they really appreciate all the information that Coast brings them. Are you getting hit with any of that smoke from those Canadian fires? Not yet, fortunately. Not yet. That is absolutely, absolutely horrible. And some reports say that that smoke is going to linger, maybe not as intense it is, as it is now, but it's going to take a long, long time to go away. And, uh, man, hasn't it been interesting how the uh, airlines have had so many cancellations and have encountered... Oh, the weather's been unbelievable for them. Yes, absolutely. Uh, tornadoes up in Indiana and Kentucky last weekend. And uh, then now with, in one report, you'll hear that uh, that it's a weather cancellation or, the, you know, in the days past. And then the next time you hear about massive cancellations, it's uh, the 5G deadline that apparently is uh, upon us. Uh, I, I'm really not too clear what the what the rush is for the 5G deadline. I know they extended it once, but um, that's that's really pretty perplexing that all of a sudden all of the airlines would be forced to to retrofit with the um, the 5G equipment. Are you still a meteorologist, or do you have to get certified every year? I still have my seal. Yes, I'm, I'm still I still have my seal of approval from. Well, I have two seals. Would you say the weather is wackier now than it was back 15, 20 years ago? I think that a lot of things are cyclical, and we're going to have really horrible weather. Um, I think that now with all that we have, social media and everything's on the computer just instantly, unlike uh, the way it used to be, you know, several decades ago, I think that the that ability to get information instantly. People have cell phones. We can take instant videotapes of everything. I think that's really a much bigger influence than people, a lot of people really think. So I think that has a lot to do with it. That really, really, really was a game changer. Cheryl's website is linked up at coasttocoastam.com. She spells her first name with two L's. How did that ever happen? <laughs> temporary period of insanity. Actually, on my birth certificate, there are two L's, but it's spelled in a different way. And I was just uh, interested in names, I guess, as a child. And all of my friends had uh, names that were spelled shorter than mine, and I kept experimenting with ways to spell my name. And and then eventually ended up uh, changing it to uh, two L's back to the way it was initially instead of just one as I trimmed it down to in, in, during some years. Was it always Cheryl with a C as opposed to an S? No, it was uh, S-H-E-R-R-I-L-L, -L, and I thought that took way too long to write. Mom did that to you? She did, but, um, but uh, yes, she did name me. My first name was Lana, and she did name me after Lana Turner and her daughter Cheryl. She just spelled it differently. That's where that extra L came out, right, Beth? Right, right. <laughs> and what got you into television in the first place, Cheryl? Well, uh, yeah, that's a that's a story. I don't know if uh, if if uh, you can handle it. Um, I was selling pots and pans door to door. <laughs> For real? Oh yes, I was. I did just like Johnny Carson and sold pots and pans door to door because I didn't. After I graduated from uh, the University of Tennessee, um, that was a different time than now, and jobs weren't that readily available uh, that you really wanted. And so I, I didn't find one in my hometown that I really wanted. So I thought, well, maybe I'll just come up with something that uh, offers me the ability to learn a skill that is transferable. I don't want to waste my time. I, at the time, I'd been teaching uh, exercise classes uh, 
is a way to earn money through college. And uh, the owner of the exercise salon I'd worked for had a cookware company, and he kept trying to get me to uh, do that. And I said, oh, I, I can't do that. I've got a college degree. I'm going to do bigger and better things. You know, and then I started looking, and I thought, he said, well, just take a look at one presentation. I was really blown away. It was a waterless, greaseless um, <laughs> Uh, stack everything on one eye of the stove, walk away, leave it, come back. And I thought, man, that's amazing. So I thought, well, I'll do this for a while. I'll, I'll learn how to do this and learn, learn how to talk my way into, you know, letting somebody um, show me a set of cookware. Well, that progressed to cooking dinner parties for groups of people. And it, it was just something that really was really intriguing to me. And from there I went on to um, my first job in television was as a weather reporter. And from there, I had a talk show, which was a, a debate format, live call-in, and like our shows are today. But you know, there were no interns or anything like that. You did everything, as you know. And from there, I kept doing weather, and then I did news, and then I did I, I mixed everything up, did radio news. So I was uh, I was learning both sides of the newsroom as I went through the years in television. All right, let's go to the phones for you. Open lines begin. We'll start with Joan in Manhattan. Welcome to the program. Hey, Joan. Hi, thank you. I wanted to ask Ms. Jones, um, do you believe that near-death experiences are evidence of life after death? I know Danny and Brinkley think so. He said that many times. He's had many of those experiences. But it occurred to me that the kind of death that you have from which you are brought back, right? You, they pump your, tr- your chest or whatever, you come back to life, and you live again for some years. Uh, when you die finally, wouldn't that be somewhat different? I don't know. What, do you have an opinion on that? Well, I, I, I'm, I'm intrigued by that, as you are, a near-death experience. I mean, a lot of, a lot of people have had them. Um, uh, we have no proof that what is experienced in that near-death experience is really, truly the final other side. Now you sound like Michael Shermer, my other guest. <laughs> well, no proof, but then you can still believe it. Um, that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. I would. I, I tend to think that since since people do go through that experience, there is something to it, and it certainly is life changing f- for people who've experienced it. And then there's the reincarnation uh, that uh, that uh, has been documented, and a lot of people have experienced. So if I had to choose, yes, I think that. The near-death experience is a glimpse of the other side. Um, where else do people have these experiences like that except on the near-death deathbed? See, the uh, skeptics would say, Cheryl, that this is just a product of the mind during the dying process. It could be. It, it could be. There are so many things that we don't know, and we think we know or we have a certain belief, but in reality... We don't know everything. We don't know what we don't know. Mr. Cornelius is with us in Alexandria, Louisiana. Hello there, sir. Hey there, George. We're burning up down here, so just pray for us a little cool. I heard it is hot. What's what's the uh, temperature feel like? Over 100? Yeah, we've been averaging 100 and be up to 110, 120 for the humidity and stuff, and I'm sweating like a hog down here. So pray for us. We've had 13 deaths from, you know, all over from Texas to Louisiana, Mississippi, from the heat and everything. Any rain in the forecast out that way? Four for July. (laughs) Well, that's next week. It's coming up. But go ahead. Look, look, George, I was just telling Tommy, breaking news, then I'll ask a question to Cheryl. They just spotlighted George Knapp. He's trying to find out about the aliens that crashed in them people's yard. It was on News Nation, so go to newsnation.com, Banfield. Yeah, he's he's been working on that for a couple weeks now. Yeah, but like I said, they're spotlighting him. Michael Shermer, of course, is a skeptic who doesn't believe in God and anything else. And Nick Pope is on the show. So go to newsnation.com, Banfield, and they've been spotlighting all week long about all of that stuff. That that was for you and the coast audience there, George. Now for you, Miss uh, Cheryl Jones, my question for you tonight, with Biden 
having this digital dollar and stuff, and I don't know if you've looked into it, do you think that we'll have the mark of the beast? And also, we've gone cashless. In New Orleans last month at the Jazz Festival, they went cashless. And here in Alexandria, Louisiana, we're going cashless. Thank you, George. Cheryl, God bless you, and God bless America. I don't want to go cashless, Cheryl. Do you? I don't want to either. This Fed now is the uh, is the big program that the central banking system is going to be pushing. And as he just indicated, some place there's a lot of beta testing going on. If uh, you look at most of the websites of the financial uh, companies and banks. Uh, and either, even large corporations, and if you look at the About Us page or our mission or what we do, that sort of thing, you will be shocked at how many of them are um, are right on all over the woke system, the uh, DEI, the diversity, the equity, and the inclusion, which ends up as part of your social credit score. And um, that's what this is all about, trying to control definitely control our bank accounts and uh, you know that's a very dangerous thing in my opinion I mean uh, banks can freeze you they can control your whole uh, all of your money um, it's happened before where they can freeze the accounts that happened if they want to if if you don't have a good credit score or if uh, you're not of the right political persuasion um, it's just uh, it's it, it's just beyond belief that so many unelected people, can create and determine, you know, these kinds of very important things for for all of humanity. Let's go to Mike near the Hoover Dam in Nevada. Welcome to the program. Hey, Michael, go ahead. Hello there, George. Mike and Livermore in Hoover Dam. Oh, well, what are you doing over there? Well, I started out a two-month road trip uh, about three weeks ago. You're following your Oakland A's eventually to Vegas, aren't you? (laughs) (laughs) No, I'm a Giants fan. Sorry. Um, And you should know that. I've taken your money over that team. Um, (laughs) Anyway, I got uh, about three weeks ago, I started my trip. About two and a half weeks ago, I was in Texas. And I I have a miracle story for Cheryl and a spiritual story. Okay, sure. Go for it. Okay, so about two and a half weeks ago, I rear-ended an 18-wheeler at 75 miles an hour. Oh, my God, Mike. And completely destroyed my vehicle. The only thing left was me in the driver's seat. And did, oh, did you get hurt at all? I ended up in the hospital for five days. I've got three fractured ribs, a broken oh, hand, geez, and multiple uh, lacerations, stitches, and everything. But you're um, alive. <laughs> I'm alive. That's the miracle. I must have had every every first responder on the scene, every trauma doctor, everything. First words out of their mouth is, son, God's looking over you. You shouldn't be alive. Um, everything got swept out of the back of my truck. The roof was ripped off. The right side was ripped off. Unfortunately, my best friend of the last nine years went out the back, my dog. Oh, I'm sorry to hear My, that. My uh, 100-pound German Shepherd, 9-year-old. Oh. We've been together since he was six weeks old. So the miracle was I, I survived. Unfortunately, he didn't. Here's a spiritual side, and I want your opinion on this. I My brother lives in Fort Worth, so I was only two hours away. So he came and collected me. Or he came to the hospital, and by the end of the week, uh, I was out of the hospital. Uh, they couldn't believe that I was getting up and walking around. No blood on the brain through all of that. No concussion, nothing. Thank God. And so I'm at my brother's house for about a week and a half waiting for my son. I flew him out. We rented a van, and we collected up what I had left, and that's why we're in Hoover Dam. Right now we're on our way back to California. But anyway, while I'm at my brother's house, he has a 9-year-old or a 12-year-old chocolate lab. From day one, when I walked through that door, that dog was behind me, following me everywhere. If I went up the stairs, he went to the top of the stairs and stood there and waited till I came up. He was sleeping outside my door or at my feet in the room every night. My sister-in-law 
couldn't believe it. She says, I've never seen this dog act this way. Uh, he's he, The only person he does that with is my brother, Gary. Uh, she's never seen that with a stranger. And so after about four days of this dog doing this, I was sitting out on the back patio, and I looked down at him, and he gave me a look that just looked exactly like my dog. And I looked at him, and I said, Tuzak, I'm okay. Boom, the behavior stopped. What do you think of that, Cheryl? Oh, my goodness. It sends chills all over me. I'm a dog lover, too. And, uh, oh, German Shepherds are just wonderful. Um, it, it sounds like that dog was <laughs> was was really uh, speaking to you through the other dog, doesn't it? Well, we believe that animals reincarnate. But here's my question. If the other dog was still alive, is it conceivable that his dog that passed on somehow inherited the body of that other dog for a little bit. What do you think? That's possible. Very possible. Is he still on the line? Yeah, he's still there. Okay, what do you think about that? Yeah, I, I think he piggybacked off of him. Mm -hmm. I think his spirit had entered into him just like a, a demon possesses someone. Like a walk-in. His spirit, his spirit entered him, and he was concerned about me, and he wouldn't go to the other side. So he was sure I was okay. Until you told him you were okay, and then he moved on. Yeah. All right, Mike, you be safe. Keep in touch with us, all right? Yes, I will, George. Thank you. God bless you. And Cheryl, keep up the good world. Well, thank you, and you take care of yourself. He's been a Coast listener for at least 20 years that I can remember. Mm. And, my God, 75 miles an hour, and you ram into the back of a semi. He's lucky he's alive, too. Absolutely. Absolutely. I've had encounters that were just were just within a, a, a whisker of uh, what would appear to be an accident that would, would not be survivable. And somehow, some way, um, uh, it all turned out well. So we do have guardian angels. I know that. Cheryl, do you take emails through your website? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. They can go to uh, Cheryl Jones. Dot com and that's c h e r y l l dot com. The email is there. Um, uh, you can email me through space news at yahoo dot com as well. Generally, how long does it take for you to get back to people via email? Generally, it just depends. I try to do it as fast as I can, but sometimes, sometimes I don't discover them because they've ended up over in. Uh, spam, or uh, and, and I do have emails that are forwarded as well from the website, and they don't. It doesn't always sync exactly the way you would want it to, time-wise. So I try to get back pretty quickly within within uh, the amount of you know uh, within a week or so if I can. It just depends on my schedule. Can you believe we're going into July? It's hard to believe, and this weekend is going to be a real touchy weekend for people flying oh my because God, of no. the five, you know, whatever they're they're doing with this 5G deadline. A lot of cancellations, too, because of the weather. That's what they're saying, too, and, and you know, so we, we will see what happens. It's a tough week to fly, or t tough weekend to fly, I think. Cheryl, we're going to come back in just a split second and take final calls with you right here on Coast to Coast AM. We'll be back with final open lines with Cheryl Jones in just a moment on Coast to Coast AM on our next program tomorrow night. My guest will be Dan Schreiber as we talk about the world of the weird. And then we go into those Friday night into Saturday morning open lines. And welcome back to our final segment. George Norrie along with Cheryl Jones. And we are taking your open line phone calls right here. These uh, open line calls, some are intriguing, Cheryl, aren't they? Yes, they, they really are really really am intrigued by uh, how many people have so many varied experiences and so many miracles and near-death experiences, and uh, it's really incredible that there's so many insomniacs. <laughs> you've done a lot of TV. You're doing a lot of radio with us. How do you like radio? Oh, I, I like it. I, there, are certain, there, there are things I like about both mediums. Obviously, television, you work with pictures, and you're always editing little movies basically is what it boils down to and uh you might have if you're a reporter then 
depending on the format of the show, you could you would have to turn over a story and get everything in a minute 30, a minute 45, something like that. Um, just a lot of different experience. I'm glad I've had all the varied experiences in terms of even starting my career way before computers came into being and uh, had to basically do everything yourself before interns, before anything like that. So I think I was blessed to be able to live in that time and to go through those kinds of uh, those kinds of learning experiences because it sure is different now. Isn't it amazing how things have progressed technologically? Yes, it certainly is. Um, when I started, uh, the station I worked with in my hometown um, it was still doing film. And then, of course, I moved. I've worked in a lot of different cities. Um, in Kansas City, the film there when I first started there and then going to three-quarter inch. And you know how heavy the equipment was when uh, you went out on a story, you know, in the field. And uh, And, in fact, I'm still in contact with some of the my old friends who have a lot of back issues who worked in that in that aspect of it with uh, shooting and editing and so on. And then beta, uh, the beta tapes came along, um, which, of course, was a little bit smaller. And now look at it. Look yeah. at the digital. I, I mean, it's incredible. Who would have ever thought? Let's go to final calls for you. Eric, truck driving in Indiana. Hello there, friend. Welcome to the show. Hello, George. How are you guys well, doing tonight? We're doing good, Eric. Thanks. Good, Cheryl. I've talked to you before. Um, I got a question for you. Due to all respect for this guy, I really, I'm a fan of him. But uh, have you ever um, interviewed Hank Williams Jr. on his near death experience? I have not. How about you, Cheryl? No, I haven't. No. I haven't. I think it would be a good story if if he'd want to talk about it. You know, I'd, that's a terror. That was a terrible accident he had. How long ago did that happen, Eric? Oh, that was back in the seventies, I think it was. He was just a young guy then, huh? Oh yeah, yeah. He was, uh, it, and I think it kind of changed him a little bit too, you know, because he. I remember him when he started as a kid, you know, and then. I kind of watched him off and on, and, and uh, it just, you know, I don't know if his, if he would have been the same, you know, if he hadn't had that accident. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? it, he fell nearly 50 feet or 500 feet off a mountain. Oh God! Yeah, and um, that was that was incredible. Have you ever been in a car accident, Cheryl? Yes, I have. Yes, I have, but fortunately never in a really bad accident. I've been in quite a few near misses. I'm I've, I've, one of those lucky people who, you know, a guardian angel is with me, I think, a lot of times. And in the not-too-distant past, not far from uh, my home, I pulled out of a, um, a, a road onto a five-lane highway, got in the middle lane because there was traffic heavy on both sides, and just kind of uh, moseying along there until, you know, there was an opening to get into uh, the lane I needed to get into. There was a a little bit of a distance, maybe 300 feet or so, to a uh, a little blind hill. And all of a sudden, I mean, there was nowhere I could go. Um, I just had to sit in the middle lane and wait. Over that blind hill came flying two state trooper SUVs. And there was no way, there was nowhere for me to go. I had no time to even try to back up. Um, There was nowhere for these two state troopers with their SUVs flying. They must have been going maybe 90 miles an hour uh, to get into their to the other lane. And in right there, in in just the flash of a of a of a moment, um, when I thought we were going to impact. Um, those two SUVs were over in the other lane and gone. I have no idea how that happened. Wow. felt my car moved. My car moved from the wind because they were so close and going so fast to me. Uh, there is no way that I could have survived that. And it just, you know, God so, was with me. Somebody was watching you. Absolutely. Let's go to Michael in Sheridan, Wyoming. Welcome to the show. First-time caller. Hi, Mike. 
Hi, how are you doing this morning, George? Good morning. Excellent, thank you. Well, uh, the reason I was calling is um, I was wondering if you had heard of Thomas Theodore Merlin. Uh, he was late late 1800s, early 1900s. Um, he was a cryptozoologist and had a huge collection that they uncovered, I believe, in 2006. He had donated his building to whatever, not not really sure, but they were using it as an orphanage. We're going to tear it down. And they discovered hundreds of crates of, you know, vampires, killing kids, fairies, mermaids, werewolves, and tons of stuff. I was wondering if you'd heard about that or seen anything or if any of his artifacts had been verified. You know, I know I read somewhere that they were going to do testing on them to see if they were authentic, but, you know, I haven't heard anything since. I have not heard of him. Have you, Cheryl? No. Did you say, you said uh, Maryland, M-E-R-R-Y-L-I-N? I, yes, I believe that's how you spell it. Oh, oh, the Cryptid Museum in London. Is that correct? Yes. Ah, okay. I, I really don't know a lot about that. That sounds very, very interesting. A lot of bizarre artifacts, apparently, uh, with a uh, with that museum, and um, it's in East London. And uh, apparently, it's uh, it's a life work and a real thing. So that would be something to that would be interesting to look into. Yeah. Now, I think it, it, he spells his name M E R R Y L I N. Yes, correct. And he had a cryptid museum. So, uh, a lot of uh, skulls and uh, I guess different stories circulating about that. And apparently, the creatures in the museum, they say, were found in the 1960s in the basement owned by this guy. Oh, a sealed basement uncovered beneath a London orphanage. And then that's creepy. Uh, yeah, this and, says uh, in this one it says 2006, but it really you know different phases of this thing, I guess. Maybe they. Yeah, that's them. really weird. And here's here's a skeleton with wings. So very strange. Yes, that's interesting. Thanks for thanks for calling on that. Thanks, Michael. Let's go next yep, to. Thank you, George. Appreciate it, Jeremy in North Dakota. Hello, Jeremy. Go ahead, sir. Hello, George. I want to update you on the count. It's now been 19 years, 6 months, and 22 days since my... Keep going. And you've got a birthday coming up uh, in August, don't you? Yep, August 9th. I remember. But go ahead. You're on with Cheryl. Um, Cheryl, I want to ask you, is it possible that in the coma I was in for two and a half months after my accident, that I woke up in an alternate reality. Well, the alternate reality is good old planet Earth. Right. You're, what, what did it seem like to you? Well, I, in my coma, I was walking up a mountain pathway with my wife at the time, and all of a sudden a bunch of boulders started falling from the mountain as we were nearing the top, and I found a little cave to stuff her in so she didn't get hurt. How big were and these boulders, Jeremy? They were they were about uh uh wrecking ball size. Well, and what do you think caused the slide for them to start falling? Um the, there was a light, a small little tremor. Well, bad timing for you, wasn't it? Where was yeah, the one of the boulders knocked me off and I was falling down ground and I heard a voice from the sky that said, Jeremy, it's not your time yet. Well, definitely isn't. You've been going strong. Go ahead, Cheryl. You were going to say something? Oh, I was just going to ask him, uh, when you heard that voice, what what ran through your mind? What did you think? I, I was thinking, I sure hope I am okay when I Hit the ground. What what's it like being in a did you did you dream much when you were in that coma, Jeremy? Um I that's the only dream I can remember. Um uh, my wife and I at the time, now ex wife, we were uh, out there uh camping and having a good time 
And the reason why I think that's important is because we both have our degrees in wildlife biology. Did you remember the accident when you came out of the coma? Um, I remembered the, seeing the Ford pickup sliding down the hill at me, and then everything went blank. Well, so when you woke up from the coma, did you? and they told you you were out for two and a half months, could you believe it? Um, I did not believe it at first, and I uh, got up, tried to get up from my uh, hospital bed to go to the bathroom, and that wasn't safe because I still don't have my balance all the way back. Yeah, kind of wobbly. That's fascinating. Unbelievable when these comas are just bizarre, Cheryl, aren't they? Oh, absolutely. So you, obviously you had no concept of time when you were out. You said two and a half months. It's out. like it's like a dream, isn't it? Right. Yeah, he was out for two and a half months. Yes. Mm-hmm. Next up, let's go to Jack in Pennsylvania, east of the Rockies. Hey, Jack, go ahead, sir. Yes. Uh, uh, I was growing up when I was a child. Uh, the electricity was invented. There was, oh, there was since then and up to today, so many inventions have been uh, invented by inventors, I mean, mainly in the United States, uh, all the inventors. Uh, and the, uh, uh, in regards to uh, the society over here on this side of the country, uh, uh, Lions Club for the children, uh, as I was growing up, was really nice. And uh, um, uh, what, Cubs, what's, Cubs, what you, what's your what's your question, Jack? Oh yeah. Well, in regards to inventions, uh, there was a uh, 60 Minutes was a satellite dish on the back of a truck about the circumference of a uh, a. Uh, well, I'm sure we're running out of time, but uh, he's right about one thing: we had great inventors in this country. Well, that's absolutely true, and might remind our listeners that. Sunday is UFO World UFO Day. One day we're going to get the answers to those UFOs, aren't we? I think so, too. I do think it's great that things are being unraveled. Um, I do think that uh, we have no way of knowing who's telling the truth and who isn't. It's uh, I've, I've seen those reports that one caller talked about on News Nation with uh, Ross Colehart and... Um, also, Nick Pope and uh, you know other people as well. So it's it's really interesting how things are evolving. Um, but it, it does seem like um, they could have moved things along faster. What I what what we don't know is who's going to be in control of the information, and will we the the people be able? Well, to... let's hope that we are, Cheryl. Thanks again, and we'll talk to you the end of July. For Dan Galante, Tom Danheiser, Lisa Lyon, Lex Lonehood, Sean Lottasaur, Stephanie Smith, Chris Burroughs, Tim Benald, George Knapp, and Ian Punnett, I'm George Norrie somewhere out there on Coast to Coast AM. We'll see you on our next edition. Until then, be safe, everyone.